All right, looks like the, the attendees have uh, largely trickled in, or at least a few more are coming in, but um, I'm, I'm happy to start. Uh, so thank you all for, for joining us for this seminar focused on preparing for the potentially non-existent future of work. We have with us Meg Megan Julefs, um, who is the Senior Associate Director of Research at the Darden School of Business at the University of Virginia, as well as Anton Kornak, um, who is the Economics of AI Lead at the Center for the Governance of AI, um, as well as a Rubinstein Fellow at Brookings and Professor in the Department of Economics and the Darden School of Business at the University of Virginia. Um, I'm Ben Garfinkel, the Acting Director of the Center for the Governance of AI, and I'm really uh, grateful for, for Anton's involvement with the organization. Um, so Megan and Anton have written what I think is um, uh, almost certainly the sort of most thorough and thoughtful treatment of the long run future of work yet written. And I'm really excited for them to, to be here today to present their work and also uh, accept uh, questions and basically um, uh, just discuss the significance of, of their investigation. Um, before we kick off, I'd also like to thank the Darden School of Business at UVA for hosting the webinar, as well as um, Emma Bumke, who is uh, the research manager at the Center for the Governance of AI, who also put a lot of work into to making the event happen. So uh, thank you all, and I guess let's kick it off. Thank you very much, Ben, for the introduction. So this is a presentation on preparing for the future of work, which may potentially not exist. We know that there have been widespread concerns that automation and new technologies may substitute for human labor and lead to technological unemployment. We have these worries against the backdrop of decades of stagnating wages for lesser skilled workers, which has led to growing political discontent. And we now face predictions that advances in AI and potentially really transformative advances uh, may be impending in the not so far future. And this really adds new fuel to the question, is there really a future of work? So that's what this seminar is about. Uh, and I want to start with a couple of premises. So first, if we look at the human brain from the perspective of information theory. The human brain is really kind of a computing device. It takes inputs and produces outputs, but that's of course also what computers do and in their most intelligent form, AI systems. So based on these observations, many researchers predict that artificial intelligence may eventually surpass human intelligence and still continue to advance. If we face these types of really transformative advances in AI that will pose lots of really severe challenges for humanity. But what we are arguing is that one major category of these challenges are economic harms, basically ever growing inequality and potentially mass misery if we do not steer against it. And uh, one of the main objectives uh, of the report that we have written on this topic is to basically lay out an agenda for how to steer against these uh, risks, how to make sure that the economic dimensions and the economic implications of transformative AI uh, would be beneficial for humanity. So, um, to look at what our main questions are, uh, there has been a long history about fallacies, about technological progress and labor. So we know that even at the onset of the industrial revolution, uh, there was, for example, the Luddite movement, and there were lots of fallacies, lots of misunderstandings for how technological progress will affect labor markets one of the most well-known fallacies uh, was perhaps the lump of labor fallacy. So that's the uh, idea that if we automate a job, there will permanently be fewer jobs in the economy and there will permanently be unemployment. We know that that's not how economies work. Uh, that is a fallacy because at least in the past, we have always created new jobs to replace those automated jobs. So 
if that is a fallacy, then kind of the first main question of our webinar is how do we make sense of predictions about labor becoming redundant? Then secondly, should labor actually be phased out if we approach such a world? And if so, then how should it be phased out? And then finally, how should we set up institutions for a future in which work may potentially no longer exist? So uh, let me give a brief summary of what our main contributions are. We will start with the taxonomy of the concerns about uh, the non-existent future of work. Uh, so this is something that uh, Megan will lead. We will ask uh, basically three questions. How do we make economic sense of the question of whether labor will be left behind, whether technology may perfectly substitute for labor, and whether labor will become economically redundant. After that, we will turn to analyzing optimal policy in the face of declining wages and the potential redundancy of labor. And then we will relate that to the design of economic institutions. So let me hand it over to Megan. Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm excited that we are all here together. Um, and I'm picking up talking about kind of the, the concerns about the end of labor, right? We, ever since the economic, no, ever since the industrial revolution, we have seen uh, that new technologies produce um, less work, it's labor saving for human beings, um, and that all of these factors have benefited us as human beings, right? As technology advances, our economic um, situation increases. And so there's kind of been a symbiotic relationship between the two. But that's not necessarily something that will happen every time, right? There's no economic law that progress will happen in this kind of a way. So there are three concerns that we're going to discuss. The first, technological progress reduces the demand for labor, right? Anton was talking about the fact that new jobs are created when certain things are automated, but that may not necessarily happen. So it may actually reduce the demand for human labor. Um, we've seen this in recent decades. Um, especially among labor for unskilled workers. We've got this lovely little chart here um, that I'm gonna walk you through. On the left side, right, this is what we've seen in the past, right? On the, the bottom axis here, we have output. On the um, side axis over here, we have wages times employment, right? And you can see that as output increases, then wages um, are also increasing at a similar rate. But if, progress becomes biased against labor, right? We see this middle chart right here where yes, wages are increasing, but not at the same rate that output is increasing, right? That there is a bias against labor in that regard. And the third situation that we may see if we actually see a reduction in the needs for labor, right? That as um, output increases, we actually see a decrease in the overall wages and employment. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about more about that in a few minutes. Um, but these are kind of different possibilities that could happen in the relationship between wages and outputs. So the second concern that we want to talk about is the technological suitability of labor. Substitutability. Forgive me. Technological substitutability of labor. In the past, right, labor is the bottleneck, right? We need human beings to be able to do things. And the scarcity of that has increased the wages over time. But at some point, the machines will be able to do everything for us. So then what? what when machines can substitute for any type of human labor, um, what does that mean, right? It's not possible right now, right? There are anyone who's tried to like, do a chat bot for a mental health situation realizes we've got a long way to go before human beings can actually um, be replaced by labor, but it's rapidly advancing, right? This notion of labor saving, which we saw in concern one, isn't a necessary condition for concern two. Um, it is necessary, but it is not sufficient, right? But if we see concern two, right, the substitutability of labor plus Moore's law, right, that things um, that we see the advancement of AI, it can lead to the reduction in human labor. Um, prediction on the technological suitability of labor, right? This is all over the map, right? 
predictions about when human beings um, will be replaced by AI or when AI can reach the level of human beings has been coming for decades, right? Elon Musk and others think it's going to happen by the end of this decade. Others seem to think it'll be the mid-2040s. Half of AI re researchers think we've still got 25-ish years to go. Some people think it will happen never, right? But computer power keeps getting faster. It keeps getting better. Um, the um, floating, floating... Floating point operations per thank second. Thank you. <laughs> floating point operations per second, right? I was like, flop, I know this. Um, is getting faster and faster. And the most powerful supercomputer now can do that at a much higher rate, but at a cost of $600 million, right? We see that Moore's law is continuing, but at this point it's still really costly, which leads us to our next point, right? The economic redundancy of labor. Just because AI can do human jobs, doesn't mean it's cost effective to do human jobs, right? You can hire 6,000 of me for $600 million, and that might be much more effective in the economic sense than to have a computer doing it. Um, so what we care about is not just what is possible, but what is co cost effective. At some point, machines will do it more cheaply than human beings, um, and it will become even cheaper than the current wages that we receive and then eventually technology will be cheaper and make more economic sense than human beings eventually, right? So human or machines can perform all economically valuable tasks cheaper than humans valued at their subsistence costs, right? This is concern three. So concern three with concern one and two, it's further in the future, um, but the big concern, right, is that market wages, what we can get for our labor in the market is below this, what we need for subsistence. And that's where it becomes particularly problematic. Some of the objections to economic redundancy, right? Well, it departs from the historical experience, right? This prediction that technology would take over all human labor has been around for a really long time. And thus far, we still have jobs, right? We've created new jobs. We have other things that we're doing than what we were doing before when technology began to change things. Some jobs might be technologically impossible or humans might just do it better. Um, people are trying to do chatbots for mental health. We'll see whether that actually plays out, but maybe humans are better at that, right? We already, uh, Anton already talked a little bit about the lump of labor fallacy, right? There are lots of new jobs that are being created. Um, just over 60% of the jobs in 2018 didn't exist in, 2000, in 1940. Right, so there's already been a lot of new jobs that are being created and it's not just a kind of a, a zero sum game. It ignores the lessons of comparative advantage, um, that there may be better ways of doing things. There's this notion that the economy needs human demand in order to survive, but it just needs, that demand doesn't necessarily have to come from labor or come from wages. There are other ways to get that human demand. Um, we could see an upgrading of humans, right? We could become cyborgs. So there'd be other ways to enhance human beings. Um, and there could be a preference for human service providers, right? Like we may not want our robot to be our confessor or our priest or our counselor, these sorts of nostalgic jobs where we're gonna wanna be able to hold on to that humanity. Um, we may see that, we may not, right? We may prefer to have a judge passing judgment on us in a courtroom, but we may as a society decide that if that judge is biased, it is more humane to have it done by an AI system. So there are lots of ways that we could think about objections to the economic redundancy argument. Thank you, Megan, for walking us through this taxonomy. So what we wanna cover next is we want to basically ask this question of how do we want to allocate work and income from a perspective of maximizing utilitarian welfare. And I wanna set this up in a really simple way. I want to start by looking first at the case of a single individual and ask this question of how do we determine how much that individual should work and how much uh, that in, how much income that individual would get to maximize welfare. So let's say that our individual needs a certain subsistence level of consumption, I'll call it C0. Uh, 
let's say that individual earns a wage or generates a labor productivity working full time that we call W, uh, like economists usually do for wages. And let's also say that individual obtains some other source of income that could be either transfer or also capital income that we call T. So then the total consumption would be the sum of labor income and non-labor income, WL plus T. So how should we allocate the labor of that individual? Well, it turns out that there's going to be three regions and they are illustrated here on this graph. First, if the sum of the potential labor income and the transfer that the individual receives is less than the subsistence income, the individual will perish. So that would be the most depressing region that we could be in. If the wage is high enough, if we are above this diagonal, then the individual will work and will at first have to work out of need because uh, the individual is not getting any other income or not enough other income. Uh, however, if that transfer rises, it means we move to the right in the graph, then the individual would work out of choice. And then at some point, if the non-labor income is high enough, if it surpasses a threshold that corresponds to this diagonal line here, W bar, uh, then uh, the individual would actually choose not to work and it would be optimal not to do so because given the non-labor income the individual is receiving, it's just not worth it to work. So in summary, we can be in either of those three regions. Uh, we certainly want to avoid the parish region, uh, but whether we are in the work or not work region, that depends on the circumstances. It depends on how much income we can make available for that individual or uh, how much wages uh, the individual could earn if they work. So that's uh, the situation for a single individual. Now let's generalize it a little bit and let's look at the case of having multiple workers who all have different labor productivity. Uh, w, I'll index it by I. And I'll again ask our question, how do we allocate work and income to maximize utilitarian welfare? So we'll assume a utilitarian planner who weighs all individuals equally. And now we let that planner choose how much should the individual work and how much consumption should each individual get. And I'll again turn to a graph to illustrate that. So here in this picture, you see the labor productivity or wage of the different individuals on the horizontal axis. And you see how much they should work, how much is optimal for them to work on the vertical axis. And that's bounded by one because nobody can work more than their entire day. And so let's say we are in an economy where these individuals are spread between W min here on the left side and W max. So they're all lined up uh, according to the labor productivity here in this graph. And now we ask a planner, how much should these different individuals work? So in an economy like the present one, what the planner would tell us is, well, the lower productivity individuals, they should work a little bit less than the higher productivity individuals because they have a comparative advantage in enjoying leisure. So from a utilitarian perspective, the optimal thing is actually for lower productivity workers to work less. Now you'll notice in some ways that's really the opposite of the way that our current economies allocate labor because many of the lower wage individuals in our economy have to work two jobs to make ends meet. But the utilitarian planner would actually allocate the income quite equally to these individuals because he weighs their consumption equally. Now let's assume that we have technological progress in this economy and we have precisely that kind of progress that Megan was speaking about before, labor saving progress. So now the economy needs less labor and um, machines can do more on their own 
the labor share of income, uh, if it is a competitive economy, would decline. What would that look like? So that brings us to the second line here, which starts at W2 bar. Turns out our planner now would choose to let all the individuals with labor productivity below W2 bar uh, to let them stay at home. And only those with higher labor productivity above W2 bar would be assigned work. And again, more work, the more productive they are because they would have comparative advantage in work. Now, that could be, for example, we don't know for sure, maybe the economy in 10 years. Then if we fast forward further, and we go to an economy where labor is truly redundant in the way that Megan uh, has explained to us, then we would end up on this third line here, which starts at W3 bar. So the idea here is that all work is phased out now. Our planner would find that it is a waste of time for all these uh, individuals, for all these former workers to spend their time uh, doing difficult work uh, if they could just enjoy their leisure and if their productivity is not very high anyways. Why make them work if the robots can do everything so much more effectively? And that's what the planner would do. And that's what would be maximizing for utilitarian welfare. Now, you may say that work is not all just about spending your time to obtain income. For example, uh, many of us actually enjoy our work, right? And um, many of us obtain a significant part of their identity, the structure around our days, meaning social connections from our work. Uh, economists call this the non-pecuniary amenities of labor. So let's expand our model a little bit to account for these potential amenities of labor, uh, to account for things like identity, structure, meaning, social connections. It turns out if we enjoy work, that partially compensates for wage income. So there is a compensating differential between the two that has been observed in economics already a long time ago. Some people, may enjoy their work so much that they find it desirable to work even if they receive no income. However, if we look at surveys, it turns out that roughly two thirds of the economy, uh, two thirds of all workers are either not engaged or even disengaged from their work. So maybe those amenities are not that important for the majority of workers. Still, uh, we have to ask our question, how would a utilitarian planner again allocate work and income if we have these amenities in addition to just the disutility of labor and the income that it derives? Well, our planner would look as, um, at amenities as something like a substitute to the labor income. And the planner would decide that individuals who either have enough labor productivity, enough high wages, or who receive enough enjoyment from their work, uh, should work, like on the upper side of this quadrant here, or those who have lower labor productivity or lower amenity values should not work. And that would maximize utilitarian welfare again. So if we include these amenities, then the lesson is we should start phasing out the lowest productivity and also the least enjoyable jobs first. Mm -hmm. Perhaps those that are dangerous, that have negative amenity value, uh, those that are really hard and unpleasant. Uh, and we should continue uh, the jobs that either produce a lot of enjoyment or that are really productive for the economy. So, so far, I have spoken as if all these amenities are something that only affects the individual. And then something that is very dear to economists, uh, which is the invisible hand, comes into the argument. 
So from an economic perspective, if these amenities are personal to each individual, then it's desirable to let the individuals choose whether they should work or not, because the logic of the invisible hand says that if you want to work, go do it. If you don't, don't do it, assuming you have some other source of income. Uh, now, how do we square that with policy proposals, which often propose that we would want government intervention to preserve work? So Megan and I, we have spent quite a bit of time uh, going through a number of these proposals. And oftentimes we found that the rationale for why we should preserve work is not explicitly spelled out. And then that creates a risk of just acting out of a sort of status quo bias. However, we found that if we want to really make sense of policy proposals to preserve work, uh, there are potential economic justifications for it. And they come in two forms. They come in the form of internalities and in the form of externalities. So these work amenities, these non-monetary factors, they may involve externalities, just like, for example, pollution, but they could be positive or negative externalities. For example, social connections are something that relies on multiple workers doing work together. Otherwise, if you work alone in your office, you won't get amenities from social connections. There may also be a benefit of work generating greater political stability if individuals have a calling on which they spend a significant amount of their time, it may help with stability. There are also negative externalities. For example, commuting gives rise to greater congestion, which rises the more workers we have who do the commuting. So whenever there are such externalities, then our utilitarian planner would not just want to let individuals choose whether they want to work or not, but would, may, would potentially find it desirable to really engage in policy measures that encourage work. There's a second set of reasons, uh, which are what economists sometimes call internalities, uh, which is essentially when individuals misperceive the benefits that something like work provides to them. So for example, individuals may not be fully rational about how beneficial the structure that their jobs provide to their daily lives are for them. They may could also be in the opposite direction. They may not realize how much they're actually overworking out of some competitive instinct, but it makes them miserable. In that case, it would be a, a negative internality. When we have these internalities, when individuals are not fully rational about uh, the amount of work that they put in and their desirability of work, then there is also a case for public policy intervention. And a utilitarian planner would take that into account. So let me now turn to the final part of our presentation, which is not about the theory of a utilitarian planner, but about the actual design of economic institutions to allocate the things that our planner has talked about, to allocate work and income. Because I think that's what we ultimately need to think about if we want to shape this potential future of transformative AI in a desirable direction. So currently, there are two main institutions that determine the allocation of work and income, and that is probably primarily the market and secondarily also social insurance. So those are what largely determine our labor choices and as a result, our consumption choices. Now, the interesting thing is under kind of idealized circumstances, uh, economists uh, talk about it as a first best, uh, it would be desirable for both of these systems 
to insure individuals against all risk. And that's something that an ideal market would do. It's also something an ideal social insurance would, system would do. But in practice, both of these suffer from the same problem. If we were to fully insure individuals, then that would create too many distortions. It would create too many disincentives to work, disincentives to exert effort. And that's why it's not feasible in the real world that we live in. Now, as a result of that, we have a free market economy with insurance markets that are largely missing. So they are in part made up for by social insurance, but of course, social insurance is subject to these potential incentive problems. And having that kind of economy with free markets, but no insurance, gives rise to large inefficiencies. And if we really arrive at a future without work, it's going to produce widespread misery. So what can we do about that? Let me hand it back to me. Thank you, Anton. So if we think about the ways in which we need to adjust in the world that we live in, right, and we think about social insurance as the substitute for those missing risk markets, right, for those pieces that are missing from the, the free trade situation, right, um, we have the kind of classic trade-off between efficiency and between redistribution. Um, that efficiency side may be mitigated as labor is phased out, and it becomes increasingly important to redistribute uh, the the gains from technology to uh, laborers. There are several kinds of transfers or categories of transfers, right? There is contingent and there is non-contingent. Many of what we see, at least in the United States, for um, social insurance programs are contingent. They're based on uh, income. They're based on family structure. They're based on ability to work or not work. Um, or then there's the kind of non-contingent, which typically we think of as like a universal basic income. Here's your money. There is no strings attached to it. Do what you want with it. Um, and then there's also in-kind versus vouchers versus cash transfers, right? In-kind social benefits could be physically providing someone with a building that is housing, right? It, it is an in-kind transfer for them. There could be vouchers in the United States. We think of this a lot with the... Um, food, the, the supplemental nutrition assistance program. Sometimes those vouchers are for really specific things. You can buy formula, you can buy milk. Sometimes they're a little more broad than that, right? You can buy food as long as it is nutritious. And then of course there's cash transfers, right? Again, that could be the universal basic income. It could be the earned income tax credit, right? You get the tax credit at the end of the year as a cash transfer. Um, there are other ways of thinking about that. One solution would be a universal basic income, right? Distributing income in a non-distortionary way. It will have a negative impact on the labor supply, but that's desirable, right? Like Anton has been talking about all the way through, right? There is this place where it, um, in the distribution with outputs where it becomes desirable for people to not work. And so the fact that the universal income will encourage people to not work, that actually is probably better for society um, in the long run to have that beginning to happen. Uh, it does require rather large amounts of revenue um, and it's in, it would impose costly tax distortions in the process of it. Um, if we replace the current system, which right now, at least in the United States, it's very much directed towards people with low income, right? Who is in the most need of help? Who's in the most need of housing? Who's in the most need of, of not going hungry? Um, a universal in basic income would hurt them if we made that transition right now. But in the long run, that kind of a universal basic income is probably the best choice when labor actually begins to be phased out. Um, our proposal would be to prepare for a future in which work becomes redundant by introducing a small universal basic income now. And when we say universal basic income, we also mean in the best case scenario, it would be truly universal, right? Like eventually it would be every human being on, a, on the planet, not just every human being in a particular country. Um, but start small, um, in to the people that need it most now and then have it rise automatically or, or scale automatically as the share of labor declines over time so that the structures are in place for when we actually need to have it. Um, and we should separate the provisions of social insurance from 
work, right? We just said this will have negative impacts on on, lab- on people working and we want that. But so many of our social insurance programs now are contingent upon work. The earned income tax credit, you have to earn that income. Um, the Welfare Reform Act of 1996 introduced a whole bunch of work requirements, right? That is all working at cross purposes um, as we think about these kind of bigger revolutions. Back to you. Thank you, Megan. So yeah, the big question uh, again to which I want to return is when is public intervention in labor markets desirable? So as we observed before, individuals should have a choice in this future world of uh, hopefully some sort of universal basic income and in which labor is no longer really necessary for the economy. Uh, So the invisible hand should give individuals the freedom to choose whether they want to work or not. And what we really want to observe uh, once again is that something like work subsidies, work requirements are only desirable when we can really identify clear externalities or internalities associated with work. And what Megan and I believe is that over time, society may actually develop much more efficient ways of providing these potential non-wage amenities of work, of providing meaning, of providing structure, of providing social connections. Right now, we may get a lot of that from work, but we won't necessarily need to in a future where AI systems can produce so much abundance that human labor has become redundant. So there is one kind of last point that we wanted to make, which is uh, that it's not only us humans who receive the bulk of their income from labor right now, but it's also the governments of the world. Governments rely mostly on labor taxation to raise their revenue. If labor really phases out, then that will suddenly no longer be there and we need to raise revenue in other ways. So that means that we really need to reform our system of tax collection, uh, our system of what we want to impose taxes on. Uh, We have uh, spent a little bit of time on that uh, in our report. For example, if we can tax bads like pollution instead of goods like labor, that would be really desirable. If we can tax things uh, that are rents and that we do not distort with the taxes, for example, real estate rents or other rents uh, that occur on inelastic factors that don't get distorted by the taxes, that would be far desirable, far more desirable than what we have right now. So with that, let us just conclude. And uh, you all see uh, there is a Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen. Let us invite you to ask any questions, any follow-up uh, remarks that you may have uh, into the Q&A box. And um, we will actually invite people who have submitted questions to turn on their mic and to read out the question. Uh, but while you are thinking about that, let me conclude again. So labor may soon cease to be the most important factor in the economy. And if that is the case, then the allocation of income in the economy really needs to be separated from the allocation of work. If we do that in the right way, there's a potential for really large welfare gains. And if we don't, it risks widespread misery both in advanced countries and perhaps that risk is even greater in developing countries. So that implies that these type of institutions to provide the social insurance that we need are really urgently needed. And I think what we also really want to emphasize is the non-material amenities of work may play a growing role in the future. So work may actually become more fun before it is phased out. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, 
for the, the wonderful presentation. Um, so uh, Andre's question is, uh, do you think that the long run impact of AI on jobs is path dependent? That is, can we influence whether labor becomes redundant in the long run by changing which AI technologies we invest in now? Um, or is the outcome inevitable one way or another? And I'll, I'll uh, leave that to, to whichever of you prefers to answer. I, I guess I'll go first. Thank you, Ben. So um, I think that in the short to medium run, this is actually something uh, for which there is a lot of potential. I think in the short to medium run, uh, we really should focus on making jobs uh, something that is both more desirable and also more rewarding for workers. Uh, in fact, uh, the Partnership on AI has a whole initiative on that, uh, the Shared Prosperity Initiative that asks this question of what can we do in order to make uh, work more rewarding for workers. And I think uh, it's a very worthwhile initiative uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm also one of their advisors. <laughs> uh, now, in the very long run, who knows? I could well imagine uh, that work as we know it now uh, will at some point be redundant. Uh, but in the in-between, I think it would be uh, really desirable to focus on making the work that we have both more rewarding and more enjoyable. Uh, right. Ben, do you want to continue uh, with the questions? Yeah, absolutely, yes. Um, yeah, what let me know if you also want to, to both jump in on any of them. Uh, so now I'll ask one from, from Risto. Uh, so which objections to, to economic redundancy do you take most seriously, if at all? Um, the World Economic Forum's Positive AI Economics Futures Report. Um, from that, um, it's the sense that um, economists uh, tend to treat historical experience and new jobs as the main objections to, to long-run redundancy. But they also mentioned that we may decide not to automate jobs, um, not just for human preference, but also for moral or ethical reasons. Um, do you have any, any response to that? So um, I personally, I uh, don't assign all that much weight to the historical experience. Uh, and in the same uh, vein, I don't assign all that much importance to the uh, role of new jobs. Uh, because if you really take this perspective that what the brain does and what machines do is information processing and the machines has just become a lot uh, better, uh, then I think we will just uh, arrive at a point where historical experience and new jobs are no longer as relevant. I do think, though, uh, that the third point, uh, we call that nostalgic jobs, uh, will be really important. So if we decide uh, we still want humans to be priests, as what Megan mentioned, uh, I could imagine that that may be a source of uh, work for the future that may go on indefinitely. Uh, Megan, would you like to add? So I, I think it could be one of those things where, again, it's a short term, long term sort of a thing, right? That we may prefer that our priests be human beings, but I also come from sociology from the survey world, right? If you're talking about really intimate questions, money, sex, people are more honest if they're answering it on a form than if they have to look at another human being. So there's a way in which I think over time, we actually might be more comfortable with our confessors being robots um, and that it is cathartic for our soul to bear our soul to someone who can't hold it against us or can't judge us for that. So I think it will be interesting to see how it plays out in the long run. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really interesting perspective on that one that I hadn't uh, actually considered before. Um, I guess this is one that I'd be interested in both of your your answers to um, from Georg. Um, how optimistic are you both about appropriate institutions actually eventually being put in place to manage the transition to a world without work? Um, and is there anything you can imagine making you more or less optimistic? You want to start? Do you want me to? <laughs> that's a tough one. Uh, I think we have no choice but to be guardedly somewhat optimistic. Now, the good thing is that there is a wide continuum between the first best allocation of a utilitarian planner that I laid out and a reality in which humans are not dying from starvation and we can be at any point in between. 
I am optimistic that we won't have uh, mass starvation. I hope we will be as far as possible towards this first best where everybody's standard of living is actually significantly enhanced. Uh, but yeah, we, we certainly can't rule out that things go wrong. I think that since we inhabit a world that has pre-existing kind of divisions, racial divisions, co country divisions, right? That the, to the extent that the first jobs to be phased out are those jobs for, for people whom we view as less hardworking or whom we view as less than us, I think that limits our abilities to put the structures into place now when we need them. And we end up in a situation down the road where we need the structures and we haven't put them into place, right? Anton and I have had these conversations with MBA students a number of times, and they keep saying over and over again, well, my job will never be automated, right? It's only those lower people who will have their jobs automated. And so I think to the extent that we think about this as being, well, not, not me, um, then we're going to end up in a situation where we need them and we don't have the structures. So to the extent that we can begin to identify collectively that this is coming for all of our jobs, I think that's what gives me more hope that we can pull this off. Yeah, if I may add one more thing uh, that Megan has just I mean, has inspired me to. Uh, so that's a, one of the really interesting questions is which types of jobs will be affected at which speed? Mm -hmm. And I think based on the advances we have seen in AI just over the past year, uh, it is actually conceivable that intellectual uh, abilities like uh, what in MBA students or also PhDs like Megan and I uh, are working on, that they may be automated first and that it's actually the manual jobs that will remain for a longer mm -hmm. time. So that essentially, we first have a software super intelligence that can do all the cognitive stuff and we will be relegated to the role of human robots. Mm -hmm. uh, and in some sense, you can already see a movement in that direction. If you think of Amazon warehouse workers, uh, Uber drivers, where powerful software systems are making all the important decisions and humans are just the executors uh, and are not really paid for their cognitive abilities as much anymore. Hello, I'm, I'm sure you both will be the, the last two to go, fortunately. Um, <laughs> uh, so another question uh, relates, I guess, to the, the, the order in which jobs go away. Um, so on the topic of, um, of political stability, you mentioned that, that instability might be one of the major externalities of jobs being eliminated. Uh, suppose we were to treat political uh, stability or the preservation of democracy as actually our primary concern with managing the transition. Uh, do you have a sense of, of what that focus might imply for how we should manage the transition? And is, is it any different than uh, what different focuses might imply? Um, just so that I make sure that I understand the question, right? Like if we put democracy at the forefront, how should we manage this transition, right? Um, I, 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 I think that's a really interesting question because if we're thinking about like, stability, we're thinking about meeting people's needs, right? How do we meet, ba not, not only basic needs, food and shelter, but how do we also meet people's needs for human connection, for people's needs for other sorts of like um, intangibles? Um, and a lot of the, the research on like, you know, when a factory shuts down, right? And it all happens right, right at once, um, that there is a lot of depression, suicides go up, like all of these things, if it happens radically, um, it causes a lot of problems if there are structures and rituals in place, right? You think about the difference between a factory shutting down and people retiring. There are parties when you retire. There is a structure. There's a script that you can follow. And I think if we're really interested in how do we preserve political stability, we provide people with structures. We provide people with scripts. This is how you phase out of work, right? This is how you begin to teach your children that their value comes from something other than working really hard, right? There's this whole movement in education right now to praise children for their effort, um, which we're training them to work really hard. But when we no longer need to work, all of this, this work we put into to making children like 
think about hard work over being innately smart might actually backfire on us in the long run. So I think that's those are some of the things we would want to prioritize as we think about stability. Yeah, so I think this is one of the points where it's really crucial to essentially have our society more prepared for the possibility that we don't all need to work 40 hours a week anymore in order to enjoy, first of all, to enjoy life mm -hmm. and also in order to have a decent standard of living. Um, and yeah, I think we can lean somewhat on existing social customs like, say, retirement. If we need to phase out work, why don't we just lower retirement a little bit at retirement age is a bit first. Uh, uh, increasing vacation time, reducing work hours, uh, doing things that fit into our established uh, societal patterns, as opposed to, you know, splitting people 50-50 uh, and saying, okay, you are unemployed now, but we still need you. <laughs> that probably wouldn't go quite as well. And unfortunately, that's how the market usually makes those decisions. If you happen to have work in the wrong company, you're unemployed. If you're lucky and you're in the right company, you'll continue to have a job. I think we also need to think too about how we perceive those that aren't working. Right, right now, if you if someone loses their job and can't get another one, there's sort of this like, well, well, what's wrong with you, or why aren't you working? Right, we stigmatize people that aren't working, or we call them like our political narratives call people lazy if they're not working, or like unmotivated, or um, slovenly millennials. Right, like all of these terms. I think we need to change the way we culturally perceive people who are not working if we also want to see this transition happen in that sort of way. Otherwise, there will be this perception with redistribution that, well, I worked hard and you're giving it to someone who isn't actually carrying their own weight, right? And so I do think if we don't think about those structures, we're going to end up with political instability in the long run. All right. Here's a question on uh, potential tensions between the um, medium run, run and long run perspective. Uh, so the question is, isn't there a tension in your report between your model, including amenities, suggesting that policymakers might want to invest in labor increasing policies and your later statement that society should try to substitute amenities with other non-work reliant sources of value? Do you think this is a question of timing where we should protect work in the short run while we prepare for the end of work in the medium to long run? Um, yeah, I think uh, the, the person who asks uh, that is absolutely right. There is a bit of a tension. And ultimately, uh, the, how we solve that tension uh, relies on how quickly we manage to transition to a system of income distribution that does not rely on labor. So right now, labor is, uh, or labor markets, uh, I could say, is the main system of income distribution that we have. Uh, for most of us uh, on this webinar, uh, the vast majority of what we will ever consume comes from what we earn in the labor market. And as long as we rely on that system, it is desirable uh, to kind of steer technology in a direction that preserves the role for workers. But the more we manage to disentangle work from income, and part of that may be a generational change, uh, part of that may be so some some generations, uh, younger generations may be able to adapt to this new world or may be willing to adapt faster than older generations. And as we adapt more and more, uh, it will become desirable to lean more on new forms of income distribution. And then we don't need to steer technology to be labor using anymore. Then that kind of becomes redundant. So that's how I would resolve the tension. So I will um, ask, uh, I think, just one more question because we're, we're nearing the end of the, the hour. Uh, so the last one is uh, that some economists, including um, Anton in a recent paper with, with Phil Trammell, I believe, have written on the possibility that AI will cause an acceleration in growth and overall a large increase in prosperity. What do you think the implications of much higher prosperity levels might be for managing a future without work? For example, do diminishing returns on consumption imply that those with great wealth might be happier to share a portion of the pie than they might have been in historically uh, less prosperous periods? Uh, yeah, that, that is, uh, I think, in some ways, the saving grace of transformative AI. 
so if we believe that AI is truly transformative and can do all the things that we currently need labor for, then it is true that the, the economy is no longer held back by the limited supply of labor. We can quickly reproduce workforce uh, the, or, or workers, uh, digital workers, by just pressing copy paste or things like that. And then we can all of a sudden produce so much more. Now, does that mean that we shouldn't worry about income distribution? I think that would be the wrong lesson. If you ask somebody from, let's say, 1800, uh, what do you think would happen to poverty if incomes around the world go up by a factor of 20, which is what it has done over the past 220 years, at least in advanced countries? And they would probably say, oh, then it would be so cheap to make sure that everybody is taken care of and we wouldn't have to worry about poverty anymore. Yet, if we look around us in today's world, uh, we are 20 times richer and there is still a whole lot of poverty, both within advanced countries and even more so around the world. And I think that observation is really why we should focus on the distributive impact of transformative AI as one of the major challenges and major risk factors when it comes to arriving at an undesirable misaligned outcome uh, that we should worry about. All right, so we've now come to the end of the hour. I'll, I'll leave a moment in case um, either of you, you feel like you have any, any closing thoughts you might want to, to, to slip in. Um, if not, then I just want to thank you both. I also just want to, to reiterate, I think, that uh, you've both written um, almost certainly the best paper on one of the, the most important topics in the world. And I'm so grateful that, that you could be here and, and, and share it and for the work that you do in general. And thanks so much for the audience for joining. And um, again, to the, the Dardian School for, for helping to, to put on the event. Thank you very thank much, you. Ben. All right. Thank you so much.